Hello, I am Selena Gore, CEO of Women Heart. I would like to welcome you today to the Women Heart Heart Talks webinar about charting a new normal for women living with heart disease. For many states and communities, the COVID-19 global pandemic has met stay-at-home orders resulting in the temporary disruption of routines of work, sports, celebrations, and just about every type of social gathering. Now, almost three months since the first closures, states and cities are reopening with all sorts of phases and detailed plans. While these plans take into account different levels of risk, few address special considerations for those who are at higher risk for both being infected with COVID-19 and having a more severe bout of the illness caused by the virus. At the top of this list are people with heart disease. For the next hour, our speakers will address specific factors that women living with heart disease should consider as their communities start to reopen. First, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Annabelle Vogelman, Professor of Excellence in Clinical Cardiology in the Department of Maternal Medicine at the Rush Medical College, and she's the director of the Rush Heart Center for Women. She also serves on Women Heart Scientific Advisory Council and is a 2019 Wanger Award recipient. Following Dr. Volgeman, we'll have the pleasure of hearing from Lori Tremel Freeman, the CEO of NACHO, the National Association of County and Health Officials. Thank you very much, both of you, um, for, for joining us today. So before we get started, we'd like to do a quick poll with our participants on the following question. So here's the question. Are women at higher risk of dying from COVID-19? And your poll will come up shortly. There it is. So we'd love you to answer um, any one, one of these answers so that we can get an understanding um, for what you all think in terms of women's risk for um, contracting COVID-19. And we'll share with you uh, the results as they, as they come in. Okay, we've gotten just about everyone answering. Are we ready to share results? Okay, so 38% uh, of you think that, that women are not at higher risk for COVID-19. Um, and so we will um, get to the bottom of that question. Um, so now I'd love to invite uh, Dr. Goldman to uh, give her perspective on the gender dynamic within uh, this COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Goldman, over to you. Thank you so much, Selena. Um, can you, uh, Selena, could you please repeat the answer since I have no internet oh, sure, access at right sure. now? Yes, so I, um, the, the uh, majority of the participants, so 38% answered um, that, they, that women are not at higher risk for dying from COVID-19. 22% um, said yes, they think that women are at higher risk for dying from COVID-19. Um, 22% said sometimes, and 18% said they didn't know. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everybody. I am so sorry, but I can't access the internet right now. But I am speaking from my phone, so um, Stephanie will be um, changing my slides for me. But good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for this important webinar. Thank you, Selena for um, the CEO of Women Heart, which is the leading voice for 48 million women living with heart disease. You are doing such important work for women with or at risk for heart disease. Thank and on you. behalf of my colleagues of the Scientific Advisory Committee, we welcome you to this webinar. Next slide. I am Dr. Annabelle Santos Fogman. I am the medical director of the Rush Heart Center for Women. And pictured here is part of our team at the center, which includes many cardiologists, nurse practitioners, but also we have nutritionists, 
a cardiocognitive neurologist and a geneticist and a social worker. And uh, right now we're working on including a pharmacologist because it takes a team to help take care of many of our patients with heart disease. Next slide. Today, we are talking about how to live a healthy life as states reopen for business and what you should know if you have heart disease. Click, please. The global pandemic brought on by the coronavirus causing the COVID-19 disease can cause a worse prognosis with hypertension, diabetes, and heart disease. Click. I will talk about how COVID-19 affects women compared to men and how the virus affects people in general. Next slide, please. So how does COVID-19 affect the heart? A summary of studies show that about 8 to 12% of COVID-19 patients have evidence of elevated levels of a heart enzyme called troponin, which suggests that there is heart muscle injury. The data is still limited in this disease, but it has been consistently shown that the presence of pre-existing cardiovascular disease and or the development of, of acute heart damage are associated with significantly worse outcome in patients with COVID-19. Next slide. A study in Italy showed that patients with heart disease who had COVID-19 had worse outcomes than patients who had no heart disease. Click, please. They had significantly more septic shock and death. Next slide. This table compares how many men compared to women are affected in different countries and the ratio of men to women who die from COVID-19. In many countries which have reported on sex data, the ratio is higher in many countries except for Pakistan and India, not, not depicted here. In countries such as Italy, Spain, China, and the other countries listed here, men who get COVID-19 have a higher death rate than women who get COVID-19. This data is not yet available in the United States, but of the reported data on deaths from COVID-19, it showed that men are slightly higher at 55% and women at 45%. So there are more men in the United States slightly higher than women dying of COVID-19 in the United States. Next slide. The chart on the left shows the cases of affected according to age and sex in, of patients in Italy. And the chart on the right shows deaths in these cases. These graphs show that there are more cases and deaths in older people and there are more deaths in men compared to women. Mm. Click, please. The graph for the U.S. also showed that there are more men than women dying from COVID-19, but not as dramatically as seen in Italy. Next slide. A study published two days ago looked at the age and sex mortality ratio of cases from Italy, Spain, Germany, and Switzerland. Click, please. It showed that people in their 50s have the highest men-to-women ratio of deaths, which decreases as people got older. Next slide. My colleagues from Johns Hopkins, Dr. Sharma and Dr. Mikos, and I wrote this paper published on May 4th, to investigate why men may be more, vul more vulnerable to COVID-19. Men are known, uh, click please, men are known to ha have more heart disease and higher risk behavior, such as smoking and alcohol use, that may be predisposing them to a higher risk when they get COVID-19. Women, on the other hand, are known to have higher immune response, which may be protective. What is unknown is whether the way the virus gets into the cells differ in men and women causing the differences. Next slide. One study in China looked at sex differences in the immune response of, to COVID-19, next a uh, click, and showed that women had a higher level of IgG, the antibody that fights infections, compared to men 
when they have severe cases of a severe case of COVID-19. So this higher antibody, click please, this higher antibody concentration in women may play an important role in preventing patients from progressing to a severe status of COVID-19 and even death. Next slide. Another question was whether there are sex differences in how the virus gets into the cells of men and women. The virus depicted here, um, that round blue um, virus, um, that brown, that um, blue figure is the virus. And the way it gets into the cell of the, um, of the humans is through a, an ACE receptor, the ACE2 receptor. And this is a very interesting um, phenomenon because a lot of patients take medications for high blood pressure or heart failure that deal with this ACE2 receptors as well. And we'll talk about that um, later on. Next slide. It is known that there are differences in how much ACE2 receptors are, there are in different organs. As you can see here, um, click. Um, the testes have a high ACE2 expression and the female organs, please click, have low expression of ACE2. It is unknown what mechanism this plays in the severity of disease COVID-19 causes. It is also known that the ACE2 receptors can be regulated by testosterone and estrogen. Next slide. The ACE2 receptor is the same receptor that high blood pressure medications called ACE inhibitors like lisinopril, enalapril, and ramipril bind to. Similar medications, the ARBs like losartan or valsartan, or herbisartan also affect the ACE2 receptors. There were concerns in the medical field that people on these blood pressure medications may be affected adversely by taking these medications if they get infected by the coronavirus. This question has been evaluated by several studies. One study from China analyzed patients who were admitted for COVID-19 in nine hospitals near Wuhan, China, and found that patients on ACE inhibitors, click, or ARBs had better outcomes. They had a 58 to 66 percent reduction in deaths. Mm. So this showed that it was good to be taking ACE inhibitors and mm. not worse for mm. them. Next slide. Another study looking uh, in New York looked at patients on high blood pressure medications and found no significant differences in the medications. They studied almost 13,000 patients and found no, click please, no significant differences in testing positive or severity of COVID-19 among hypertension drugs. Click please. Next slide. Another single center study in China looked at patients who were taking these medications and found that there was no difference in mortality in patients taking ACE inhibitors or ARB medications but they had significantly less inflammation. Click, please. So this showed that the HFCRP is a lot lower in patients who are taking ARBs or ACE inhibitors. There was no significant difference in the death rate. Click, please. So it showed that patients on ACE inhibitors or ARBs had less inflammation. Next slide. One question that, are, that is always asked by people is whether they should be taking hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin for protection. Well, we know that hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine, if taken in such high doses, can lead to poisoning. And this, if taken too much, can lead to weakening of the heart muscle and low blood pressure. It could slow the heart rate down and cause arrhythmias. It can, we know that um, in combination, especially with azithromycin, which is the other drug that has been touted to be helpful in COVID-19, can also prolong the QT intervals. And we know that women have longer QT intervals than men. So this is especially uh, potentially dangerous for women with heart disease, especially if they have low potassium. And um, so it's very important not to take these medications. Click, please. 
the FDA cautions against the use of hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine for COVID-19 outside of the hospital setting or a clinical trial due to the risk of heart arrhythmias. Next slide. So please watch out for the symptoms of COVID-19, and these symptoms can appear two to 14 days after exposure to the virus. So if you are exposed to somebody who could potentially have the virus, um, watch out for these symptoms, and if you do have these symptoms, please call your doctor right away because you may have um, been exposed and you need to be watched more carefully. Some of these symptoms are fever, cough, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, fatigue, muscle or body aches, like flu-like symptoms. symptoms. There is this interesting um, symptom uh, that's a new loss of taste or smell that's been um, uh, talked about in the media, so watch out for those symptoms. Click, please. These symptoms are more um, troublesome. So please call 911 or seek emergency medical care right away if you have symptoms of trouble breathing, persistent pain or pressure in your chest, new confusion, inability to wake or stay awake, or bluish lips or face. Next slide. This has been so concerning to many healthcare workers, and I wrote an op-ed about this that we are noticing that we are no longer getting a lot of calls or seeing yeah. patients with heart attacks and strokes, and we know that that hasn't stopped. But what has stopped is people calling 911 for symptoms of stroke and heart attack. As a matter of fact, we have been seeing worse heart attacks coming into our emergency room because they waited too long. And we know that if you wait too long to call 911 with a stroke or heart attack, you can lose muscle or brain tissue. So please call 911. The American Heart Association has put out um, PSA or public service announcements that COVID-19 has changed a lot, but the bottom line hasn't changed. Click, please. It is still safe for anyone to call 911, so please call 911. Click. It's still the best chance to live. Please click. So thank you for listening to me. These pictures are from the Wenger Award Dinner last year with my colleagues and my Women Heart Champion group leaders who are wonderful and help so many of my women patients to deal with their heart disease. And they are a great resource of information. Thank you so much. And now I'm going to turn it over to Lori. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Volman. Thank you. That was an a, a incredible effort, just given that you don't have Wi-Fi. So we really appreciate it. If any of you on the call have questions for Dr. Volman, please um, submit them to our Q and A um, so that we can uh, take questions at the end uh, of of the session. Um, so now I'd um, very much like to um, welcome um, Dr. Uh, Lori Trummel Freeman. Um, to speak on um, the issue of states reopening. So before we do that, we've got a poll, um, another poll that will help us sort of get a sense for what you all are concerned with. So here's the question. What is your greatest concern as your state reopens? Please answer now um, uh, on the poll and you can click as many answers as, um, as apply to you. Um, so uh, go ahead and, and we'll, we'll give you a minute to, to answer. Great. So let us know when uh, the, the poll results are available and can be shared and then we will um, move on to this talk. Everyone voted to make sure we register all of your responses. Can we share the results? Yeah, here we go. Okay. Um, so this is interesting. And Lori, you can see these results on your screen. Great. So yeah, 81% of us, the majority of us, the vast majority of us are worried about um, other people's behavior as we venture out. Um, and 72% of us are worried about becoming ill with COVID-19. 
Uh, so um, without further ado, I'd love to turn it over uh, to Lori Freeman. Good afternoon, everyone, and I'm so glad to be on today's webinar to dialogue with you about the National Association of County and City Health Officials, the role of our local health departments in COVID-19, the opening of our states, and especially considerations related to women living with heart disease and the impact of this special population. Today, our local health departments are truly community health strategists, and they are on the front lines of this response. They have to work collaboratively across environment, policy, and systems level actions that directly affect the health, safety, and equity of health in their communities. And they really must remain primary conveners of other stakeholders in their communities always, but now more critical than ever in this pivotal time in our history of battling this particular disease. They bring together diverse sectors, including mayors, county supervisors, educators, housing, labor, fire, EMS, law enforcement, and other key community-based organizations to do their work. Next slide, please. A few words about NACHO. NACHO is the only organization dedicated to serving every local health department in the country, and we serve about 3,000 local health departments by um, providing cutting edge, skill building, professional resources and programs, and supporting overall effective local public health systems and services. NACHO um, is made up of the local health officials and the staff that serve those departments as well as others who have joined, um, including state public health departments as well. Next slide, please. In terms of local public health and chronic disease policy and prevention, this is data from our 2016 National Profile of Public Health Departments. We are currently working on the 2019 data. Local health departments work heavily in the space of primary prevention services for chronic disease with about 57% of all health departments having active programs and about 80% of large health departments doing work to prevent chronic disease. Similarly, a great many local health departments work in areas that are complementary to chronic disease prevention, including providing nutrition services and counseling, tobacco prevention services, in working to improve physical activity in communities. On the policy side, our health departments work on related chronic disease policy, including such areas as school and child care policies to encourage physical activity, reducing the availability of unhealthy foods, increasing the retail availability of fruits and vegetables, urban design to improve physical activity, expanding access to recreational facilities, nutrition labeling, and policies to decrease consumption of unhealthy foods and beverages. Next slide, please. Local health departments work strategically to identify local level strategies to advance policy systems and environmental change for their communities where people live, work, play, and worship. They do this to work to reduce the risk factors of cardiovascular disease, as well as to address health inequities. The top two strategies used by local health departments are to work on influencing healthy lifestyle styles and behaviors and creating healthy environments and communities, including access to early and affordable detection and treatment for cardiovascular disease. Next slide, please. In terms of their role in the COVID-19 response, they provide general education to the community, answering questions and translating information into languages spoken in the communities and addressing the worried well in the community. Providing uh, provider education on what symptoms to look for and how to report if there's a suspected case of COVID. Actively working to combat stigma in their communities, working with special populations at risk, We've heard a lot about homeless populations, long-term care facilities, uh, the poor and underserved um, prison uh, facilities, and they work with those special populations. They also implement their all hazards preparedness plans to full response levels during a crisis like we're in right now and maintain key public health infrastructure and services while all hands are still on deck in the response to COVID. A big part of what local health departments do is contact tracing. You've heard a lot about this over the last several weeks. 
including making sure there are quarantine facilities, safe places for people to isolate, um, providing wraparound services, social services for those who um, are having difficulty um, isolating or themselves from others, as well as monitoring people under investigation and self-isolation. They've also worked, um, as I mentioned before, across their community with a broad group of stakeholders. Next slide, please. So heart disease, stroke, and other cardiovascular diseases are the leading causes of death, disability, and healthcare costs in our nation today, unfortunately. It costs it accounts for about one in four deaths in the United States and is the leading cause of health disparities and contributes almost a billion dollars a day annually in medical costs. We talk so cavalierly these days about one billion, one trillion, but to really give it some perspective, if you would take one billion dollar in one dollar bills and put them in a stack, your pile would be 70 miles high. These are examples of one day's cost of heart disease, stroke, and other cardiovascular disease. And this is why public health and prevention need emphasis in addition to health care for the set of diseases. Despite increases in awareness over the past decades, only about half of women recognize that heart disease is their number one killer. Heart disease is the leading cause of death for women in the United States, killing almost 300,000 women in 2017 and representing about one in every five female deaths. Next. As we think about women and COVID-19, especially those contributing factors to heart disease, this is a study, um, well, actually, I'm sorry, I moved ahead a little bit. Um, this is a map from the CDC that shows heart disease death rates and concentration of death. As you can see, the deep south and areas of Missis east of the Mississippi are highly concentrated areas. About one in 16 women aged 20 and older have coronary heart disease, the most common type of heart disease. And heart disease is also the leading cause of death for African American and white women in the United States. But we'll come back to this a little bit later as we talk about reopening the states. Next slide. As we think about women and COVID-19, especially those contributing factors to heart disease, this is a study out of the Kaiser Family Foundation that looks at stress and worry associated with COVID. Women are far more likely to worry and stress about someone in their family getting sick from COVID, retirement and college savings being depleted by COVID, that they will lose income due to COVID, that they will not be able to afford testing or treatment related to COVID, and that they will put themselves at risk of COVID exposure because they cannot stay home and miss work. This is an extraordinary impact, not only on women's mental health, but physical health. Studies suggest that the high levels of cortisol from long-term stress can increase blood cholesterol, triglycerides, blood sugar, and blood pressure. These are common risk factors, of course, for heart disease. This stress can also cause changes that promote the buildup of plaque deposits in the arteries. So this is serious um, business in terms of the worry being caused by this disease to women in our country. Next slide. Knowing where to look for the next COVID trends and infection and spread is really important. Counties with zero new cases over the past 14 or more days have accomplished an important milestone and may no longer have active cases, but still some caution and discretion is really needed in scaling the opening of the economy and balancing those efforts with, with good public health practice and disease mitigation efforts. You'll see on this map, there are very few green areas, which indicate the increase in the number of days since a new COVID case has been identified. Since still in much of the country, there have been far fewer than 14 days since the, the last case was noted. Yet we continue to see and hear about states moving through their opening stages now. Next slide. In terms of lockdown, a majority of states are in the stages of easing restrictions on previous lockdown activities. Two states, Alaska and Wisconsin, have lifted all restrictions. North Carolina and DC have kept current restrictions intact 
but the rest of the states are in various stages of lifting restrictions. Restrictions, of course, range from sheltering in place and stay-at-home orders to opening restaurants, retail stores, nail salons, gyms, as well as limiting gatherings, access to public places like parks and beaches, opening daycare and schools, and so on. Next slide. I'd like to shift gears a moment and provide some examples from Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi related to COVID, the demographics of those impacted from COVID, reopening status and the state of the virus in these particular states. If you recall, the Deep South was where we also just looked and saw there are high concentrations of women dying from heart disease. So given the significant propensity for death in these areas from cardiovascular illness, I thought it might be interesting to look at the overall risk in these areas to women outside of their pre-existing condition. Next slide, please. Let's take a look at Mississippi first. In terms of sheer COVID positive cases in Mississippi, women are far more likely to contract the virus in Mississippi than their male counterparts. It's also alarming that black women are significant more at risk than in contracting COVID in Mississippi than either their white or male counterparts. Equally alarming are the underlying conditions associated with deaths by COVID in Mississippi on the upper right hand side of this slide. Hypertension and cardiovascular disease are the leading causes of comorbidity in this state. On the lower half of this slide to the left are the current COVID trends in Mississippi. The 14-day trend shows a 19% increase in COVID positive tests, low availability of ICU units to house sick people. The state is doing okay on their percent of test target of 500,000 per day, but the state still has a fairly high positivity test rate of 7.2% of even though it's decreasing. On the lower right are the reopening states, status for the state of Mississippi. Despite rising COVID positive tests in the state, restrictions are easing in Mississippi with churches resuming, casinos opening, salons, barbershops, and gyms opening, as well as restaurants and parks. Also gatherings of up to 20 people will be allowed to, to gather for outdoor activities and 10 people for indoor. Next slide, please. This is Alabama. Here we see women are tracking slightly behind men on confirmed COVID positive testing. The striking thing about Alabama, however, is the incredible percentage of deaths associated with comorbidity for co cardiovascular disease at 65.3%. With Alabama's 14 day trend of COVID increasing 31% positive, restrictions are still easing with limited operations of restaurants, hair, nail salons, and gyms. Other warning signs in Alabama include low ICU availability to accommodate the sick, low testing capacity, and higher positivity rates for COVID. This is another perfect storm. Next slide. This is my last example, and this is Louisiana, a state particularly hard hit early with COVID. Here we see a large disparity in racial impact in cases for women are slightly less than those of men, but still high relative to some overall COVID gender stats on contracting the disease um, when we look at the rest of the United States and the world. Striking here though is once again, the underlying conditions, hypertension at nearly 58%, cardiac disease at 20.5%, congestive heart failure at 13%, and obesity at nearly 18.85%. At the same time that the 14-day trend of COVID showed a 51% increase in Louisiana, restrictions were still being eased with hair and nail salons opening, gyms, casinos, churches operating at 25%. And this week, the state will enter another phase of reopening, presumably with even less restrictions. The bottom line, if you're a woman at risk with heart disease, you will want to take precautions, um, not only if you live in these three states, but in general, but you really want to pay attention to what's going on around you and uh, in, with regard to this disease as well. So let's talk about what you can do. Next slide. 
Before we get to that, um, I wanted to show you one more of the unanticipated outcomes of COVID related to um, the utter and complete distractions created for folks who have had to manage their day-to-day -day health and special conditions. This graphic from the Commonwealth Fund shows the extent to which there were relative declines in specialty care visits from March 2020 through today. From March 1st to April 5th, we saw a staggering 61% drop in cardiology visits. And although there were some rebound, this was probably associated with the rapid uptick of telehealth and virtual visits. Even this past month, there was still a one third decline in visits overall to people visiting their cardiologists. This represents a significant risk factor for those with serious heart issues in an area that needs rapid attention to help people return to some normalcy and in terms of addressing their heart health. Next slide. So in terms of the guidance and, um, and much of the guidance from the CDC you know, remains good. So I would always point people there and these are some of, of that guidance um, on the next few slides. First of all, there's no special protocols per se for higher risk cardiac patients to prevent COVID-19 exposure, but individuals can protect themselves by doing the stuff that you hear about every day. Frequent hand washing, physical distancing, um, really staying on top of vaccinations because any illness can weaken the body's ability to fight off the disease. Um, avoiding close contact with those who may be carriers of the disease and, and we know that children um, uh, rarely develop serious illness. Well, that's changing a little bit, um, but they may be asymptomatic carriers who can still transmit the disease to vulnerable family members. Women should remember to exercise outdoors when possible, keeping safe distance, get enough sleep, manage those stress levels. We already saw the impact of COVID-19 on stress and really eat a balanced diet. These healthy habits not only help bolster the immune system to help ward off this disease, but uh, women have to live with their heart disease even after the pandemic has subsided. So these are just good habits in general. Next slide. Serious heart conditions, including heart failure and coronary artery disease, congenital heart disease, um, pulmonary hypertension, um, obviously put people at higher risk for severe illness from COVID. But if you, you, you really need to remember to really take your medication exactly as prescribed, um, continue, um, uh, don't, uh, forget to take it. Make sure that um, you indicate any questions to your healthcare provider. Um, take your blood pressure. Be sure that you have an ample supply of your heart disease medications um, and that you're not putting yourself at um, risk by having to go to the pharmacy frequently or to the grocery store to get these prescriptions. Get as many as you can at once. Um, continue self-management to control your blood pressure and take your medication as directed um, and really make sure you're up to date on, on um, your necessary vaccinations. Next slide. I think this is it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lori. And that, I mean, I, I've learned a lot just in, um, in that session. So um, thank you so much for sharing all of that really rich information. Um, now we're going to go to the Q&A um, portion of our webinar. And um, I, I see we've got a lot of Q, uh, questions coming through on the Q&A um, section uh, of, of Zoom. So please feel free to continue to add your questions here. So I'll just start um, by, this is the first question that will go to Dr. Voldman. Um, Dr. Volkman, the question is, does a statin or Zetia or Zetia have any effect? So this is uh, the question Selena, about... Can you please repeat the question? Sure, of course. So the question is, does a statin or Zetia have any effect? Um, so I guess this is a question around whether or not taking a statin will have an effect on your risk for um, sure. COVID-19. Very good question. Actually, there is no data on that, but there are some data from the SARS-CoV um, 
in 2002 and 2003, um, mm -hmm. there was some um, uh, clinical studies that were done to look uh, at whether uh, patients who had um, were given statins or anti-hypertension uh, medications did better. And they felt that because of its anti-inflammatory effects that it may improve outcomes. And the observational studies did show that statins were helpful in, um, in these patients. So there's no definitive data on that, but I would continue to take those statins only because it is an anti-inflammatory drug for your cardiovascular system. And also you don't want to stop those statins or Zetia that can lead to heart attacks or strokes, and that would be um, very uh, bad for anybody who's doing that. So I would continue statins and Zetia to lower your cholesterol and do all that you can do to prevent um, having any um, problems. Thank you. Um, next question, um, again, for Dr. Boldman. How does, um, how does a CHF patient tell a difference between regular shortness of breath and possible symptoms of COVID-19? So there's probably no significant difference, but what I have heard from um, case studies and from anecdotal reports is that you can be feeling good one day and very sick the next day. So you really need to watch your symptoms. You need to continue to stay healthy and exercise so that you can notice these differences right away. Um, if there's any questions, please call your doctor or call 911, and you don't want to take a risk because the, the longer you wait to go to the hospital if you have COVID-19, if you're really sick, there are many things that doctors and nurses can do in the hospital to prevent you from getting intubated and getting pneumonia from yeah. this disease. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so a uh, question for Lori. Um, question is from Marianne. How do we get a state public health official to open when, we, when we've done everything we've been asked? I live in, she, this is a question from California, Santa Clara County, and we have very few cases. Um, so the argument is that the, there is um, obviously some politics potentially at play, um, but the, the, it's sort of, I guess, the, the risk ratio, you know, if, if there are very few cases in their, in their county, um, what, what is the guidance or how could, how could they kind of inform the process of um, making that decision to open up again? So um, you are right in one um, very important sense is it is very political um, and it's, it's a shame that that is the case. Um, but there is great guidance. Um, there's the White House plan that, um, that the White House has asked governors to follow to look at three major indicators uh, before they reopen. And those, um, I, I gave some examples of those, but as a reminder, basically you need to have a 14 day downward tra trajectory in your cases, but case positives. Um, and that does not have to be um, a contiguous 14 day trajectory mm. downward um, because we've seen little spikes here, a day here, a day there. That's one indicator. Um, you have to have the capacity to test and prove that you have the capacity to test um, those people who are sick or ill or in need of a test, you have to have ICU bed capacity um, and, and be able to, um, and to treat those who are sick. So the governors of states have been given these um, parameters as guidelines, but because we're a democratic society um, and uh, the states um, can make their own rules, it is really a state decision. Um, in terms of what you can do as a consumer is you can reach out to your local legislator and ask them what the status is of your own community. Um, in some states, um, there are different rules for different communities in terms of relaxing some of these restrictions. Um, and if you have a small number of cases and you, all of these other things are in place, it's possible that your community could relax restrictions before the rest of the state. Great. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Lori. Um, I think this goes back to Dr. Volgman. Dr. Volgman, this is a, a question um, from Lisa. Um, she says, there are answers from studies now. But small numbers of people, or or or, or, or but with small numbers of, of um, patients, or are, are short term. At what point will science facts from science research overwhelm rumors and guesses as worldwide as worldwide accepted facts, um, so that we can trust what we learn? Um, so I, I, this is a question I think about how the science is evolving. Yeah. So I just wanted to let you know um, since uh, December. Uh, 2019 up to today, I was looking up articles, and there have been 16,000 publications wow. on PubMed alone. 16,000. That's it's mind-boggling. Yeah. So there's a lot of evolving data, and we don't have a lot of answers yet. But I I think we're starting to get some answers. As a matter of fact, the, the question of hydroxychloroquine mm -hmm. is already, um, the, the data is already being analyzed, and we may have some information about that, whether it's safe, whether it's effective in preventing severity or even pre preventing the disease, can be answered as soon as maybe next week. The other data that um, is forthcoming are the remdesivir studies, which is an antiviral drug that was meant for Ebola virus. Um, it was not effective in Ebola, but it seems to be having some good um, uh, good data coming out um, with this um, coronavirus. So I think we are going to get some answers very soon. Um, you know, there's just so much data coming out. We've been trying to do studies at Rush. And every day that we try to get, gather the data, there's, you know, 100 more cases that we have to look at. Yeah. So the data just keeps piling on and on. But as um, hopefully the numbers start to go down, we can make some headway into answering some of the questions that we have. But I think we'll be able to answer a lot of the questions um, in the next um, few weeks and even months. The vaccines, you know, obviously we'll, we'll have to wait because we don't know how effective it is. They are they are getting some data on whether they're building antibodies to the to the vaccine. So that's mm -hmm. um, welcome news. Yeah. But we don't know if it will actually prevent um, the COVID-19 disease, even if they have those antibodies. So that's another question. But you know, we have to be patient um, and uh, do the best we can. As Lori said, you know, you have to practice what everyone has been saying practice social distancing and hand washing. And until we have that data, we just have to be more careful. We know that social distancing has worked because That's we right. didn't see that um, huge surge um, in a lot of the states that closed down. Uh, in Illinois, we closed down pretty early. The, um, mm -hmm. Our mayor, uh, Mayor Lightfoot and uh, Governor Pritzker were so aggressive in closing down Illinois and Chicago. Um, that it really did not overwhelm any of the medical centers. Uh, so we were very lucky. We were not um, overwhelmed like New York was. So our death rates have been much, much better um, than um, New York State. So I think mm -hmm. it does work, and we just um, need to practice the safety measures that Lori talked about. Thank you very much. Um, um, could I yes, add to of that? course. Yes, please, Lori. I just wanted to bring to the attention of the listeners um, uh, that the CDC um, is really rapidly putting out um, what uh, a regular publication up to three times a week now, um, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly, MMWR, that attempts to do small pieces of early research on COVID-19 in this case, um, rapid examples that um, they're put out this way so that larger research agencies, universities, and others can pick up on the early research and, and take it to full scale. And so there is a lot being done um, in rapid um, ways, uh, but I wanted to bring attention to that particular vehicle because it's meant to generate interest in areas of uh, COVID-19 that research that need to be followed up on um, by greater studies. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, I, I want to just take take um, a moment also to to just reflect that this is a, a such a rare moment in in our lives where 
This is a very active area of research. There's still a lot we don't know. So as the more we're learning through um, research uh, and through studies, the whole world is kind of following the story along on the scientific side of things. So the idea that you know there will be a time when everything, the scientific fact, will be established, and there will be you know one one sort of set of you know understand that that will come, but that's going to take quite a bit of time um, because the the uh, different countries around the world are, have their own different experiences with the virus, and so what that all of that data needs to really be brought together. Um, which is some of the data that, uh, that Dr. Goldman shared with us. Um, but still, this is very much is still a, an evolving situation on the science side, not just on uh, the social side, but on the science side as well. Um, so there's a, a, I think this is a really important question that's come up, and, and I would um, ask either one, um, Dr. Goldman or, or Lori, to, to share your thoughts. Um, one question is, is it true that you build, you, you are more, you're less likely to build up resistance to COVID-19 if you stay indoors and connected to that wouldn't would would the the impact of being on lockdown increase the chances or your likelihood of um, depression or other mental health issues um, and all of that you know all of that comes with and how do you how would you suggest weighing out that balance because right? there's those are very real these are very real considerations and very um real real time um uh questions that that people are asking themselves so this is dr volman i yeah. i, I want to just um answer one one question about that um is that it, staying indoors does not give you resistance unfortunately Staying indoors is just preventing you from getting the disease, but it doesn't, unfortunately, increase your resistance. So this is, I think that was one of the questions. Yes, that you it, was asked. In, it was in that question. Yeah. And I, Sorry, would add, I don't know if you have anything to add. No, I would just add that, um, you know, we talk about lockdown um, as though we are prisoners in our home when. Um, you still can go outside <laughs> um, and you still can, you know, take the proper safety um, precautions mm -hmm. and, and follow the recommended guidance and, and still, um, you know, not fully be a prisoner in your own home. Um, and especially for, for those with, um, with heart conditions, you know, I, I know that I've, uh, I have a very busy job. Um, and I've actually benefited from being home during this response mm. because I end up exercising outside every day when normally I don't have the time in my day or I can't find the time during daylight. So there are um, ways to sort of um, make lemonade out of lemons in this case and maybe um, spend more time outside um, getting exercise and enjoying the outdoors and, and safely, of course, and keeping safe distance from others. Yeah. I, I totally agree with that. I think that we have to make lemonade out of lemons. I, you know, have been talking to a lot of my patients uh, during these um, times with tele teleconference, televisits, and uh, phone visits, and um, a lot of them are actually doing very, very well. Um, mm -hmm. As long as they are staying um, out of harm's way, sheltering at home, having people help them. What, what is very concerning are, of course, the healthcare workers who are exposed to um, the disease, and they are uh, especially the ones who are not getting good um, uh, protect, personal protective equipment. They are the ones getting very ill, and uh, some of them have died. And so um, I know that some of our patients are healthcare workers, and they yeah. do need to be yeah. especially, especially careful especially if they have cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, or obesity. Obesity is turning out to be another risk factor other than uh, mm -hmm. all the ones that we've already mentioned. So, mm -hmm. you know, the best thing we can do is to eat healthy, exercise, and um, prevent the disease. And yeah. like we m mentioned already about how to do that. Right. 
Um, we have so many questions um, still coming. So um, I'm going to just take the ones that um, I think would apply to, a, you know, a, a whole uh, a whole range of people. Um, Irene wants to know, um, and maybe for you, Jeff, this is important, Dr. Volgman, um, what are your thoughts on keeping routine medical appointments such as blood work um, uh, or a, uh, an appointment with an internist, dental cleanings, routine mammograms? These are things where you just cannot socially distance. Um, and what, are, what, what would your recommendation be for those, um, perhaps not essential, but still very much part of you know, the, the, the health care routine? Sure. Good question. Definitely, if you have any concerns at all, if they've been postponing any of your tasks, like colonoscopies because you have been bleeding or mammograms because you felt a lump, those are not elective procedures. And those we are doing, we never stop doing them. We just had to do them in a certain way to make sure that everyone's protected. Um, we want to protect our patients and we want to be protected as healthcare workers. So we are doing all of those procedures. If you have any concerns at all, we will do those procedures. We never stop doing um, stress testing. Um, so anything elective, we postpone. So if it's elective, it is possible that you should um, postpone it, like a routine mammogram and you have no symptoms, you don't feel anything in your breath, I would postpone that. But if you have any concerns at all, it's better to get the test over. Don't be afraid to go to the hospital. The hospitals have taken painstaking measures yeah. to make sure that you are protected and we are protected from you. So please don't hesitate to um, seek help. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and a question that I think many of us women who, um, you know, have, have longer hair than normal are asking is somebody with congestive heart failure is asking, um, should they go to hair salons? I know it, there's been a lot of, of hair salon news lately. Um, and maybe, Lori, if I can ask you to answer that question. Um, is it advisable for um, somebody with congestive heart failure um, to go to the hair salon? So um, you, you not, not only need to pay attention to safe distancing and the other um, guidelines um, to protect yourself, but you have to take a little bit more extra care when you have one of those underlying conditions. And I would say that um, the best bet is only go to the hair salon if they offer uh, a really stringent um, distancing protocol. Maybe they take appointments and you're the only one person in there or um, a, a part of a small group in there. But, um, you know, you need to do what is safe for you to keep yourself healthy. And I would not go return, immediately return to a hair salon that opens its doors without having uh, really significant safety protocols in place. Thank you, Lori. Thank you very much. Um, and we are almost at the end here. Um, so I, I want to thank you all. But before I do, I just want to um, remind us that this discussion really brings home that the idea is for some of us going back to normal, whether that is, you know, in a social way um, or um, going back to work is quite risky. Um, because of the underlying, con underlying conditions that we might have. Um, so we need to make sure that um, there are policies that allow workers um, for whom the risk is too high to be able to continue to not go to work and continue to um, be able to stay outside of, of the work environment and to have paid leave in order to be able to do that so they don't lose their jobs. Um, and so that you don't have to decide between a paycheck and your health. Um, women heart has an online action that allows you uh, to email your representatives and ask them for paid leave policies that take into account women with heart disease specifically and others with chronic conditions that put them at a higher risk for COVID-19. Um, so in the chat, there's a link. And if, um, if you would, please um, click on that link and take action. Um, such provisions in, are included um, uh, in the recently passed House bill. I mean, we're, we're keeping um, on top of it and making sure that we get to a final legislation package that helps you, um, helps you all and that includes your voice. So thank you very much to all of you. Um, please join us next week um, on, this, on Wednesday um, for uh, a, a webinar on um, let's get physical, staying healthy, um, and staying active while staying safe.
Thank you very much to Dr. Volgman. Thank you very much to Lori for joining us. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. And thanks to our sponsors who have made uh, this webinar series possible. Thanks again. Selena.